Hello, my name is Adrienne Antonsen, and this summer I worked with Dr. Mark Showalter on Saturn's F-ring using Cassini images to get the big picture. And up here we can see Saturn. The F-ring is this thin, dusty ring about 3,400 kilometers outside the main ring system. And this close-up Cassini image reveals clumps within the F-ring. The F-ring has a really um, irregular structure that's very constantly changing. These clumps that you see have a lifetime of about one to three months. So within just a period of a few months, the entire structure of the F-ring can change. So it's a very quickly changing dynamic ring. And the goal of my project was to study the evolution of these clumps over time to learn more about the properties of the F-ring and its physical processes. So to begin with, I took raw Cassini images such as this one. I then calibrated them um, over here and did an automated pointing offset correction from the red line right here, which is where Cassini data thought that the F-ring should be, to this green line, which is um, done through a brightness interpolation to find the true position of the F-ring in all the Cassini raw images. And then once we know the position of the F-ring, we go over here. I stretch the image into a radius versus longitude horizontal profile of the F-ring which um, reveals the clumpy nature and structure of the F-ring. Then right here, we see a, we put all the images from a single observation together in a sort of mosaic way, like piling them together where they belong to an uh, interpolated position for a given time. So then through this, we get a, a very long stretch of F-ring structure. Um, this mosaic is composed of 36 images and Observations are a collection of images taken at very similar times in viewing geometries. So this is pretty much a snapshot of the F-ring at a given moment in time. And as we zoom in on the F-ring profiles, we begin to see these clumps more clearly, which, um, is that 30? Okay. Which then, um, once we get these clumps for all the observations, we can track them over time to learn more about the evolution of the F-ring over time and possibly even trace back to its origin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Allie Bramson, and I'm an astrophysics student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I worked with Cynthia on a project entitled A Search for Ongoing Geologic Activity on Jupiter's Satellites. So Galileo went to the Jupiter system in 1997-ish um, and orbited 35 times. And then about 10 years later, New Horizons went by there and also collected data of Jupiter and its moons. So the first goal of my project was to use Galileo base maps. So here is an example of a Galileo base map. It's a sinusoidal map projection, so it conserves area and minimizes distortion. And it's made of a mosaic of dozens of Galileo images. And we wanted to make simulated views of this to kind of mimic the New Horizons data so that we could make comparisons between the 10 years um, on the surfaces um, to look for changes to indicate ongoing geologic activity. So I found the subspacecraft longitude and latitude, so this coordinate right below the spacecraft, and I reprojected this base map onto that point and then made it into an orthographic map projection, which is a view from overhead. And we were able to get uh, these reprojections that looked really similar to the New Horizons data. Uh, they're a little bit higher quality or higher resolution, but we were still able to see surface features in the New Horizons data and make surface comparisons. And we did not see any changes to Europa, Ganymede, or Callisto, which was kind of predicted. Um, but these images will be used in the future to look for, um, to be able to correspond spectral units to surface features to determine their composition. Um, the second part of my project was to look for changes on IO. It's actively changing, so we couldn't use the base map because the base map is already outdated. So I found some new changes, and here are some examples where you can see um, here there's a new dark plume deposit a new dark lava flow surrounded by a bright plume deposit in this circle, um, circular feature. 
And then here you also see some new plume deposits that are bright, and you can see that they've covered up some old dark lava flows. Um, also here it's dark, um, and you can see some new dark lava flows. Hi, uh, my name is Keaton Burns. This summer I worked with Frank Marchese and Julie Belrose investigating the orbital stability of spacecrafts exploring multiple asteroid systems. So these are systems that consist of two or three component asteroids that are orbiting around their mutual center of mass as the system rotates around the sun. Uh, so there have never been any spacecrafts that have orbited multiple asteroid systems. The only time that they've been explored was by uh, Galileo, which in 1993 flew by Ida and Dactyl and took these images. Um, and, but that's the only time that they've ever been visited. In 2010, the COMPASS team released uh, a NASA discovery mission concept, which would send a spacecraft named Scarlatti to rendezvous and orbit several multiple asteroid systems, here's the flight path, uh, including 45 Eugenia and its two moonlets, its two small moonlets, uh, Petit Prince and Princess, and uh, 90 Aniope, which is a system composed of two comparably sized uh, doublet asteroids. Um, so my job was to develop an n-body simulation which could, exp which could calculate orbits to explore these asteroid systems and determine if there were any that were stable for over 20 days. Uh, to do this, I wrote my simulation in Python uh, using a fourth order runge cutter integration method. And it takes into account the gravity from the sun and the four gas giant planets. Uh, it also takes into account the non-spherical shape of the asteroids in these uh, systems and the solar radiation pressure of the sun on the asteroid. Um, the results that I found was I found for the 90 Aniope system, we were able to determine that stable orbits existed for in the uh, retrograde equatorial plane at all radii, all the way down to a 3 to, three to 2 resonance orbit, which passes just within several kilometers of the surfaces of the asteroids. Um, however, due to the mass ratio in the system, none of the five Lagrange points were stable for more than two days. So those are the five uh, critical points in the effective potential map seen here. Uh, for 45 Eugenia, we did orbits around both of the moons, found that we could get stable ones close by. And uh, future work for this project includes better models of the extended asteroids, Monte Carlo approaches to find more stability regions, and spacecraft impulses for station keeping. Good afternoon, my name is Amber Butcher. I am a geology major at Cal Poly Pomona and my mentor this summer was Dr. Lori Fenton. I am talking to you today about morphology and classification of Martian dunes, specifically low albedo dunes south of negative 50 degrees. Um, I utilize JMARS to render high rise images within the study area. And since dune formation is strongly dependent on climate change, transport capacity, and wind direction, and sediment supply. It is thought that studying these dunes would help us understand weather and sediment on Mars. Here's an example of one of the high-rise images. Um, this here is the face of a dune, and these streaks are indicative of grain flow. And I chose this image because until recently, it was thought that none of the dunes on Mars were still active. And grain flow is indicative of active dunes. Oh, sorry, wrong direction. So I studied these and I took note of the morphological features and, the and classified the dunes and I looked for latitudinal trends. Again, I used for my example grain flow. The blue bars indicate all of the dunes and their corresponding latitudes that I was able to find high-rise images of. The red bars are indicative of the possible grain flow dunes. As you can see, they're definitely concentrated at the lower latitudes. I found quite a few of these latitudinal trends. Uh, this is just one example. And um, hopefully in future papers and presentations, the rest of these will be uh, presented. Thank you. Hello, my name is Thomas Katnak. I've been working with my mentor, Billy Barrett, to make a, a survey of methanol masers to look for short-term variations. Uh, so some of the objectives for this proje project were first to develop detection methodologies that could look for these short-term variations, whether those are you know, longer periodic, like minute-long variations, or pulses, 
uh, that could be either from extraterrestrial civilizations or from pulsars pumping the masers. Uh, so we also we wanted to look at 30 methanol masers, and we did this in July. And then any of them that showed short-term variations, so we wanted to go back and make follow-up observations of those for longer, uh, longer periods of, of uh, observation. And so two of them exhibited periodicity, and so we went back and made 40-minute observation of those. So some of the detection methods that we used were um, pulse folding, which basically is where you have your incoming data stream, you fold it at a period corresponding to the period of the pulse that you're looking for, and then you get two populations, the, the population, the, the power of the data without a pulse, and then the power of the data with a pulse. And so you can look at the statistical distribution of this to, uh, and identify these two populations using kurtosis. Um, and then also looking at uh, fluctuating spectral analysis, which you'll see here. Uh, these are two masers, one of them, G4949, which exhibits periodicity. Here you can see kind of the frequency bin, and then also the, the time evolution of that. Uh, here is the integrated spectra of the maser, and you see different, very nice maser line here. And then by integrating in uh, frequency bin this way, and then you can see it's time evolution, and here's the signal to noise ratio, and you see definite periodic trends, it's very nice structure within this maser. Uh, on the other side, a maser that doesn't show much periodicity is uh, G3521. And here you can see that there's, in the signal to noise ratio, uh, it's very noisy and uh, you can't really make any uh, observations about periodic trends. Uh, and even when you smooth this out using uh, filtering, you see even less uh, variation than this. Um, hi, my name is Ashley Curry, and my mentor is Rachel Mastrapa, and I'm a biology major at Cal Poly Pomona. In this talk, I'm going to be talking to you about infrared spectra of ethane and ethane water mixes. So here's a picture of our lab where we take the data. Uh, this is where we make our gas mixtures, and I'm going to be focusing on the differences between ethane, pure ethane and ethane water mixes. So here you can see a spectra. Um, the blue is pure ethane, and the red is an ethane water mix. Um, this peak right here at about 2.27 microns, uh, the one in blue is very indicative of ethane. It's used to spot ethane in spectra. Um, there was a spectra of the Kuiper Belt object where they actually used this peak to identify ethane. So if you mix it with water, you can see that the peak here changes dramatically. Uh, it's no longer split. And it just it looks completely different. However, the center remains <coughs> fairly constant. So this is a good peak to identify ethane with. Uh, this peak here at about 2.31 microns, the center shifts a little bit, uh, but could still be a good peak to look for ethane. Uh, this peak here at 2.4, the shoulder, the ethane pure ethane peak is extremely wider than the water mix, and the the water mix splits into almost two peaks here. Same thing with this peak here at 2.46 microns. Another thing we looked at is temperature uh, dependency of these peaks. So this figure here is all one chemical. It's a water ethane mix. Um, it's a 20 to 1 mixture. So 20 parts water for every one part ethane. Um, the peaks here shift dramatically. This peak here, this peak here, and this peak here. However, the peak at about 2.42 microns remains fairly constant. So that would also be a good peak to look for ethane with. And this is just another figure showing temperature dependency with water ethane mixes. Thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Jake Edmond. I worked with Dr. Friedman Freund this summer investigating the magnetic asymmetry of mid-ocean ridges due to positive hole currents. Um, so the first thing to know is that positive holes can be activated in nearly any rock when the heat is applied. So this is a graph of a current flowing through a piece of gabbro that was heated at one end, and then uh, an ammeter was attached to the other end. So the important thing is that at mid-ocean ridges, you have a thermally active region, and then there is a thermal gradient from the center to the edge of the continental shelf. And then if a current flows along this, along this thermal gradient, you have a magnetic field generated 
parallel to the ridge. And one side, on one side of the ridge, that magnetic field will be pointed one way, and the other side will be pointed the other way. So in the case of a north-south ridge, this magnetic field can actually be recorded in the thermal rem thermally remnant magnetization that is what recorded as the rock cools and is recorded in the ferromagnetic domains of the material. So what we actually see is that the, the anomaly is in the predicted direction for north-south running ridges and is much greater than for the, the east-west running ridges that were investigated. So that, it, that indicates that there is a large current flowing from the center of the ridge along the thermal gradient towards the edge. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Evan Firth, and I worked on the stability of oxyhalides in simulated Mars environments. And so in just a little bit, I will tell you that we found out that perchlorates break down under simulated Mars environments. But first of all, you probably want to know, why does that even matter? So if you go all the way back to Viking, Viking did some biology experiments and found the soil had unique properties. Now to date, no one has actually found compounds that explain those properties and exist on Mars. But Phoenix came along, and Phoenix showed that we have a lot of perchlorate, especially in comparison to chloride. That, well, sadly, perchlorate doesn't explain the Phoenix results, or sorry, the Viking results either. However, if you have both perchlorate and chloride, it is likely that you have the in-between oxidation states. Now, in order to say that those in-between oxidation states uh, can explain the Viking results, first you have to show that you can get to those in-between oxidation states. And in order for that to happen, we have to be able to see the breakdown of perchlorate. So that's why we're testing to see if perchlorate can break down under Mars conditions. And like I said, it can. This is an XPS of perchlorate run under simulated Mars conditions. Um, this particular one, the blue is not exposed to anything UV or ionizing radiation. The red has been exposed to ionizing radiation. We simulated it with an XPS uh, flood gun. And you can see here the formation of a new peak indicating a new compound. Now necessarily that new compound has to be a lower oxidation state than the perchlorate. If you look at all the possible products, chlorate, chlorite, hypochlorite, magnesium oxide, magnesium chloride, and chlorine dioxide, every single one of those is a lower oxidation state. So that we know under simulated Mars conditions, perchlorate breaks down into a lower oxidation state. Therefore, the experiments that are currently going on right now, seeing if those in-between oxidation states explain uh, the Viking results, which, hint, so far they do, those are actually valid experiments now because we've shown that perchlorate does break down under these conditions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Freeman, and my project this summer was an investigation on the origin of 2008 TC3. So 2008 TC3 was an asteroid that was observed from the Earth and then later uh, hit the Earth. And from this impact, uh, meteorites were recovered, which are called Almohada Sitta. And so in the bottom left, I have a plot of Almohada Sitta uh, reflectance spectrum from the visible to the near-infrared. Um, and so my project this summer was to uh, prepare a lab mixture to simulate these urolite meteorites, which are the type of Almohada, which is the type of meteorite that is Almohada Sitta. And so in the bottom right, I mixed olivine and pyroxene of different percentages uh, to simulate these zero lights and so you can see the one micron band that is present in both of these and the two micron band uh, present. Uh, I also used, I tested three kinds of carbon as a darkening agent and I plot that here and show, the, show how the carbon darkens the olivine and pyroxene spectra. Um, the second part of my project was to reduce telescopic data of these asteroids, of asteroids and families related to 2008 TC3. Um, and so the two telescopes that we used were uh, called CALA 2 meter, which is plotted in the black, and the IRTF uh, 3 meter telescope, which is plotted in the red. And I put these two together uh, in these two plots. And so you can see in uh, the spectrum of Keeler, you can see the 2 micron band and the 1 micron band, which is present in the Almohada Sitta. And then in Keeler, you can see the 1 micron band and uh, a lack of a 2 micron band which uh, shows that, that these two asteroids uh, have two different shapes, and that's very interesting. Uh, so we observed nine of these uh, asteroids that could be related to 2008 TC3 in total, and uh, we observed five other F-type asteroids last summer with the CAST telescope. 
uh, the CAS spectrograph. And, uh, yep. Okay, thanks. Hey, good afternoon, my name is Craig Hill, and I'm from the University of Missouri-St. Louis. My mentor for this summer was Dr. Jennifer Blank, and my research primarily concerned the petrographical and geochemical analysis of Del Puerto ophiolite carbonates um, from um, the California coast range. Um, the Adobe Springs and the Del Puerto Canyon is about two hours east of the SETI Institute. And this is an excellent site to use as a Mars analog because the rock chemistry is ultramafic and very similar to Martian rock chemistry. The goal um, was to look at this because this is unique in that this cementing would not form under these thermodynamic constraints. So there must be some assistance from bacteria. The bacteria are bioprecipitating and hopefully producing unique biosignatures, which is what I set out to find by analyzing 20 gridded carbonate thin sections. This is a thin section grid. And there were four primary types, um, textures I observed. Lamellae, which was layering of carbonate. One layer lamina, dentiform carbonate, and turbid carbonate. What was interesting after we performed scanning electron microscopy and EDX analysis and electron microprobe analysis was that the turbid cement and it had uniform chemistry, which we didn't quite expect. The dentiform was primarily abiotic calcite. The lamellae was the most interesting and also the lamina, because this first layer and there was um, magnesium rich. So it might be possible that even though we didn't quite see any unique biosignatures, the bacteria still have to produce this first layer to facilitate consecutive layers. Thank you. Um, I'm Jenny Kulo, and my advisor was Jean Chire. Um, and we were trying to determine whether there's a, a fundamental difference in the dust characteristics between diffuse ISM and the dense clouds. Um, I had 33 different sources available from the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the data came in chunks, so I had to piece the chunks together to get a full spectrum of the s star plus interstellar medium. And then in order to observe the silicate features, um, I had to fit a continuum of the stellar flux plus the stellar photospheric features. And um, I divided out the continuum to um, get an optical depth spectrum. And this is my spectra with the um, continuum fit. And this is the optical depth spectrum. And you can see the 9.7. Uh, micron silicate feature at the 18.5 micron silicate feature here. Um, so did we find any differences? So far I've plotted um, 18 different sources um, for the optical depth versus color excess and um, I found that the um, diffuse um, sources do indeed have a steeper slope than the dense cloud sources. Um, and also when we were fitting the extinction curves to our sources, we had to write a new extinction law, which indicates that there is indeed a, a characteristic difference between the defense, the diffuse and dense um, uh, interstellar medium. Um, we also looked at the shape of the silicate feature. Um, this is the 9.7 uh, micron silicate feature. Uh, I only have one of my sources plotted on here, um, so it may not be a fair uh, comparison. Um, 
and the in the future we want to find uh, the ratio of the 9.7 to the 18.5 micron features and it'll tell us about the mineralogy and shape and porosity of the grains. Hi, I'm Erin Lighty. I'm a physics major at Fordham University, and this summer my mentor was Dr. Peter Yaniskins. I'm going to be talking about the Hayabusa reentry mission and the spectral data we were able to obtain from it. So this summer, early in June, I had the opportunity to join an international team of scientists to observe the reentry of Hayabusa. You can see the mission team here. And we went to Australia to observed the reentry of Hayabusa, which was a mission to the asteroid Itokawa to potentially bring back samples. The goals of watching the reentry of Hayabusa were to gain spectra, which would be used to analyze the effectiveness of the heat shield. From spectral data, we can determine things such as how, much, how many fragments were lost from the reentering capsule, um, the heat, the temperature, luminosity. So to do this, we had an airborne observation campaign. This is the DCA in the background, which was set up with various instruments, all taking different recordings of spectra at different wavelengths. Oh, oops. Um, sorry. My instrument was Astro, which is a CCD camera which a diff with a diffraction grating attached to the front of it. Um, this is the raw data we gained at the time of peak heating of Hayabusa. You can see the capsule here. The spectra of the capsule is this faint line, and this is the bus breakup. The capsule and the bus breakup were very nicely separated, which led us to have separate spectral data of the capsule and of several fragments. Um, I identified five separate fragments. Next goals are we've plotted light intensity, um, which then have to be compared to other instruments data and also previous models. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Seth Meitzner. I'm an astrophysics major at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and my mentor this summer was Dr. Jerry Harp. Um, I worked on two different projects that were pretty separate. The first of those was trying to improve the primary beam um, effectiveness in mosaic observations for the Allen Telescope Array. Um, when a normal mosaic observation takes place, you have a pointing scheme. In these, we have 19 points. Um, it's a hexagonal shape. Um, and you look at each pointing for a while, get your data, and move on to the next pointing. Um, what this does, due to the fact that the beam is Gaussian, is you have more sensitivity towards the center of each pointing and it trails off towards the edges. So what Jerry proposed to make the mosaic more uniform was to execute small circles around the center of each pointing. Um, it's a new idea that nobody had really tried before, so we weren't sure what to expect. Um, the radius of each circle was at the half width, half max of the beam. Um, for our observations at 1.42 gigahertz, um, it was 1.21 arc seconds, I believe. Um, so we set up our script and took data about two and a half weeks ago. Um, and we got two circular fMRI, so two circular patterns and two regular mosaics. On the left, we have one of our mosaics with the regular pattern. Um, and you can see that the RMS is about 31 Janskys per beam um, after some basic flagging and gridding. Um, on the right is the circular, and you see that it looks a lot better. This RFI is gone and uh, a much lower RMS noise level. Um, these data were taken on two separate days, so it could be attributed to that. Um, the best thing to do with this is to come back again in a couple weeks, take some more data, and uh, get some better flagging on all these to see if we really do pull out better data from the circular ephemeris. Uh, we'd expect to see the outside of each pointing um, brought forth a lot more. Um, the other thing that I worked on this summer wha was not that. <laughs> is this autocorrelation for SETI signals. Make this fast. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> um, we used out a correlation on data from blazars uh, to look for small time scale variations. Um, we found them in BL0716714, which has period it's known to be intrinsically periodic. 
Um, so here are a couple peaks. <laughs> Um, and you, this is one that had no autocorrelation, no peaks. So come back to this, see if we can break it down, <laughs> and hopefully we'll find those variations in a couple weeks, meaning they are intrinsic on that level. My name is William Myers. I'm a geology student at Earlham College, and my mentor is Dr. Laurie Fenton. Um, my project this summer was uh, studying yardangs. Yardangs are aeolian features on, are um, streamlined aeolian features on Mars, and uh, they are blunted at the at the windward direction and are streamlined backwards. Uh, my project was to look at Yardang's, high-rise images of Yardang's and GIS, and draw polygons around them, and take the area of the polygon and find the centroid. Um, after, uh, then I would find a bisect of the polygon and find the centroid of that. And if I take the uh, vector of those two, I get the direction the wind is blowing because of the shape of the Yardang. So I do a hundred of those um, yardangs, and I get a whole field of yardangs, and then I plot them on a um, polar plot, and I get the direction the wind's blowing. So I can apply this to multiple. Um, I can apply this to multiple fields of yardangs and get the directions of the wind at the form time of the formation of the yarding field. Hello, my name is Janine Mishka. I'm a student at Villanova University studying astronomy and astrophysics. And this summer I had the distinct pleasure of working with Dr. Rachel Mastrapa in her lab, um, taking spectra of methanol and methanol and water ices. In the uh, lower corner here, I flip the, there we go. In the lower corner here, um, I have a picture of our lab set up with a bulb on the thing on the system. It can get down to 15 degrees Kelvin and a pressure of 10 to the minus 8th torr, so it's a pretty good vacuum. Um, up here I have a picture of uh, the gas line where we mix our bulbs that um, contain the gases that we use on the gas line. We can either use a pure gas or a mixture, um, such as mine was a 20 to 1 mixture of water to methanol. And we get to our 15 degrees Kelvin using liquid nitrogen and um, liquid helium in a cryo cooler. Um, here I have some of my results. And the top part here is just pure methanol at various temperatures. Um, in the terms of a time scale, it was the 100 Kelvin, the 116 Kelvin, and then the 15 Kelvin was taken back down to that temperature. And you can see over here there's a feature in the 116 Kelvin and the 15 Kelvin that shows that it went through a phase change from the um, 100 Kelvin. So there are also shifts um, horizontally with temperature um, with the features of ethanol. And at the bottom I have a uh, graph of ethanol in water versus just pure ethanol. And um, in the ethanol in water the, sh the features will shift um, this way in the uh, spectrum. And this is a correlation. This peak has moved over slightly to the right. And if you want to find ethanol in um, water in identifying it, the best place to find our uh, methanol is at 2.26 um, microns. Um, we can use this data with uh, reflectance spectra to identify methanol and methanol in water. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Natalia Petrikiva from Rice University, and my mentor is Adrian Brown. And this summer, my project was to search for abbreviated material in CTX images of Nilai Fossae. So, um, this is the global map of Mars, um, color coded for elevation, where red is high and blue is low. 
And Nila Fossa is this little box over here. And it's very interesting because uh, it's a big fracture on the surface and it is clear of dust. So CTX and CRISM can actually detect uh, minerals and um, evidence of life or water that uh, may be preserved. So um, CTX uh, is a context camera that provides context images um, over big surfaces, uh, large areas of Mars, and CRISM provides detailed maps um, of surface mineralogy. And uh, 18, 20 months ago, CRISM has actually detected the presence of magnesium carbonates um, in the Nilai Fossae. And so what I did was to put together this mosaic using 31 uh, CTX images over this region um, to try to recognize carbonates. They're recognizable because they're bright and small outcrops that occur like in these regions. Uh, so right now we try to extend CRISM observations to cover uh, larger areas, like this is 500 kilometers, um, to try to locate and map carbonates and look for evidence of life um, and water on Mars. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lee Saper, and working with Janice Bishop, I've been correlating reflectance spectra of clays on Mars with laboratory spectrum. And uh, why are we looking at clays? Well, clays are interesting because they contain water and OH bound in their crystal structure. And we know that through geologic analyses on Earth that clays are formed either by direct deposition of sediment into open basins or by, liquid al by alter chemical alteration by liquid water. And each clay has a specific crystal structure, and it's the way that it, it attenuates electromagnetic radiation that produces these characteristic absorption bands, uh, which can be indicative of H2O or aluminum, iron, etc. And this is useful because we don't really know much about the aqueous history of Mars, so we can use these clays to kind of reverse engineer what might have, what were the conditions where they were formed. So what I did was look at a a uh, fresh, relatively fresh crater on Mars, um, which provides a pr relatively pristine window into the geologic units that are beneath the surface. And so we use these characteristic ab absorptions to identify the minerals that were present. And we found, consistent with other observations in the region, a iron magnesium clay at the bottom of the crater and then overlain by an aluminum clay. And what's interesting is that the, at the geologic contact of these two clays is a unit that contains ferrous iron, that's Fe2+. And this is unusual, we, we don't really see this in clay formation on Earth. And that's indicative of this positive slope from one to uh, two microns here. So what I did was correlate different, well, what I did was mix different types of uh, clays, a ferrous chlorite and a iron magnesium smectite, which is this nontronite in the laboratory, and tried to see what was the effect of the different ratio of uh, minerals on the positions of the absorption bands. And what we found was that this ferrous material that we added had, be, had, had uh, absorption bands that were symmetrical about this primary uh, iron band. And the idea is that uh, we can use these types of studies to kind of understand what, were, what the informational environment was for these clays uh, in, and the ancient water history of Mars. Thank you. Hello, my name is Steffi Valkov, and I'm working with Peter Jeniskins this summer on a project called CAMS, or California All-Sky Meteor Surveillance. Uh, the problem with meteor showers at this that is that there's 365 meteor showers on the IIU's working list, but 64 of those have been established. Only 64 are meaning that we know they exist for sure. And the, pro the, the reason for this project is to see if we can get those smaller meteor showers to be established. Now, this is a picture done by a company called Sonotoko in Japan that took data from one year and they plotted all the meteors here. You can see the Perseids and the Leonids, which are more well established showers. But the point of the project is to be able to see smaller showers, such as this one. And when we worked this summer was at Fremont Peak Observatory and at Lick Observatory. This one's in San Juan Bautista, and this is by San Jose. 
And the point of the project was to put two boxes of cameras, one at Lick Observatory and one at Fremont Peak with 20 cameras each, which would point out at the night sky. And every, each box of cameras will have a 360-degree view of the sky, 30 degrees above the horizon. And the type of, we were getting video feed from these cameras, and a surveillance system was used to record the data from these cameras. And the, the program that we used was BCSI, or Border Collie Solutions Incorporated, to record the data from the video. And the software we used to calibrate the cameras is called Meteor Cal, written by Pete Gurrell. And what I did this summer was I took these, I, I did a structural analysis at Fremont Peak because we put the box on top of the roof. So that created some problems with the weight, and I designed a simple truss solution which would help to hold up the box for a longer time. And at Whit Lake Observatory, the main problem was wind, so I, deci I decided to make a bunker which would hold the cams box and allow the wind to go around it, which helped a lot to, divert, to keep the cams box safe. And so we're actually going to go to watch the Perseids tonight at Freeman Peak, and we're going to get some data from that. And we're going to uh, record with pen and paper where meters are in the sky and then compare it to what the actual video cameras record. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colin Williams from Kansas State University, and I've been working with Dr. Friedemann Freund on the changes in radar reflectivity of rock surfaces due to stress-activated charge carriers. So when rocks cool from a magma, they trap water in, the, in their crystal lattices as, as an impurity, and typically these impurities remain inactive and have no real effect on the macro properties that you can observe of a rock. However, when you stress rocks or they undergo physical deformations, the charge carriers become activated and they flow through the rock and they have effects that you can measure. Um, they affect things like conductivity, surface potential, and even the ionization of the air around the rock. So for my experiment, I wanted to measure the effect of these charge carriers on the radar reflectance of the rock. To do that, we set up a ground penetrating radar looking at the surface of the rock. And we took this rock, this hammer drill here, and drilled a series of holes in the, in the, in the boulder, um, which was diorite. And we filled the holes with an expansive hydraulic cement, and then just observed what happened as the pressure built up and these charge carriers became active. So this next graph shows our results. The x-axis is the trace number, so that really just shows the time from when we poured the cement to the end. And the, the y-axis is the, the strength of the signal return from the rock surface calibrated to the um, strength of the signal from a corner reflector, which is there just for um, calibration. And as you can see, the strength of the reflected signal did increase after we poured the cement. So this is a really nice result because it confirmed our um, hypothesis of what would happen. So for the future, we want to repeat the experience experiment more and more and we have a, a few more rocks to go so we're just gonna keep working and keep rocking on so <laughs> <laughs>